right opposite the house was a slipway which led down to the beach, to the sea. Uh, and this was a wonderful opening. But sadly, in 1942, the Germans closed it up uh, because they built a bunker, which meant that we were then living in a fortified zone. Uh, there, quite obviously, when the built bunker was complete, it would have a crew, and the crew would need somewhere to live, and they would take one of the five houses, of which my parents was one, uh, and they took the one at the end. And we were all terribly sorry for poor Mr. and Mrs. Treguer, who were given 48 hours notice to leave their house. We were terribly sorry for them, but they were crocodile tears, because I'm sure in each case, certainly in the case of my parents, but thank God it wasn't us. The people in the bunker, we had very little contact with them, the the Germans, uh, and but uh, occasionally, the great disadvantage is that we were then living in a fortified area, and we had uh, access to the house. The curfew was normally at ten o'clock but we had a curfew at nine o'clock. Now, I was in my early 20s, and as you can imagine, that was very restrictive on my social life. A transport was either feet or bicycle. Uh, frequently, I came back at about 10 past nine, and the barriers were already up, and I would be standing there helplessly, and one of the guards would come out of their house at the end, and never once did he refuse to open the barrier, and I would go through, and I would put my finger on my head, indicating that I was late, and point to my watch, and make little signs. Although I personally had very little contact with individual Germans, the few that I did meet and had some contact with uh, were people so like, so like us. They were uh, very, very normal, kindly individuals. I see a photo here of three young men. Uh, two were brothers. Goodness me, each one of those had uh, a much more a dramatic wartime history than I did. If you've ever seen any episodes of Dad's Army, uh, I was Private Pike. I was the office boy, uh, number seven in hierarchy, in the Jersey sub-office of the Southampton branch of a national insurance company. I could not possibly have had a lower social status than that. We talk a great deal nowadays about how difficult it is for the young to find jobs. I had the equivalent of A-levels uh, and thought that I was very lucky indeed to get a job of any kind, even as the office junior uh, 
in this sub-office of a Southampton branch. Uh, my pay, incidentally, was £40, uh, not a week, a year, um, which uh, was very little, but uh, one well, money values have changed so much. One could then buy a pair of shoes for today's equivalent of 40 pence, and so one could cope with care. Uh, one of these young men, uh, his family left for England uh, shortly before the arrival of the Germans. He went with them. Uh, they left in a great hurry. Uh, there was a three-day period of evacuation boats on any transport available. And uh, his he came back. Uh, well, he'd started farming and had things he wanted to clear up. And there was a whole week of a strange interregnum of what seemed like normality. We began to think that perhaps the Germans wouldn't come. Uh, and he came back, and, and largely, I think, to collect some of his mother's jewellery, which the family could sell. Like many Jersey families, all their assets were here in the island, and they arrived in England and were refugee paupers. He got caught here, uh, but was determined to escape, and eventually did so in September of 1941. The whole story of that escape, his name was Dennis Vibert, a very Jersey name, uh, and he uh, escaped with a boat with an outboard motor. The story has been told repeatedly. Uh, the outboard, the boat got flooded with water. Uh, when he was attempting to refill the boat, with the, the engine, a wave slopped into the tank. It was useless, so he pulled the motor up, put it in the boat, but he had a spare motor. With running, of course, on petrol, which he had siphoned himself out of the tanks, of German trucks. Uh, he was fitting the spare motor over the back into two hooks, which he could not see with the sloop of the boat, and he dropped the engine into the water. Somewhere off the west coast of Guernsey, he now had a useless engine in the boat. He threw that overboard and he began rowing. And it took three days for him to reach, not England, but he was off Portland Bill and was intercepted by a British naval destroyer, which was escorting a, uh, a convoy of coastal shipping. Uh, he couldn't hold the rope they sent down for him. His hands were like two hunks of meat, raw and bleeding. Uh, nor, nor could he speak. His throat was, throat was swollen. He had swallowed salt water. He had fallen asleep and would wake up when the water slopping into his mouth. Uh, he was hoisted onto the destroyer. Uh, he was not released. The British authorities didn't know he could then, uh, this was 15 months into the occupation, he might well have been a German spy. Uh, 
Uh, and so he was under questioning, uh, what they call debriefing, but it was really questioning for two weeks before he was released. Uh, and then the story became public, was in the papers. When he went down to Devonport, he joined uh, his family. He had no money at all. He had no change of clothes, but uh, the clothes dried out, I suppose. He went down to Devonport to collect the boat. His parents gave enough money for him to put the boat on the train. Uh, when he got there, there were two men in uniform that looked like naval officers, and they congratulated him on the feat and said what a splendid little boat it was. Um, Carvel built, was it, uh, built in Jersey? Oh, yes, he said with insular pride. And then one of these, what he thought were naval officers, said, yes, we thought that was probably the case. We're from His Majesty's Customs. And they charged him import duty. His brother, the chap in the middle of the photograph, the very thin one, he had an incredible war in Burma. Of course, most people know that the war in Burma was won by the Americans, commanded by Errol Sin, because they saw it on the film. Uh, in fact, uh, the war in Burma, the reconquest of Burma from the Japanese, was largely by British forces, greatly aided by Indians. I see another photograph of a very pretty girl with whom I was picking blackberries. A sad story of unrequited love. Uh, she was in love with somebody else. This so often happens when one is very young. Uh, she did marry. He was in the British Navy. They communicated eventually, when it, that was possible, by Red Cross messages of 25 words and she received a proposal of marriage by a Red Cross message. And she replied that way. By the time she received it, uh, she didn't know he was still alive. Uh, by the time he received her yes, uh, he was not to know if she was still alive. They both survived the war. They did marry and lived happily ever after. Uh, I see a photograph, a photograph of me standing in the water with a small boy on my back, lap, and that sort of small boy appears again. He had a very close friend who was the son of friends of mine, where there were four children, and I see a photograph of he and that friend diving into the water, and the photograph of the house where they lived, into which they moved, at a rent of 75p a week. It was a new house, three bedroom, above average standard, but it had just been built by a stack builder and not sold and people were not buying property during the war, and the spec builder was very happy to let it for 75p a week in today's money, uh, to have it occupied. An empty house was dangerous, was uh, subject to vandalism. People would go in and simply rip away the banisters, the flooring, uh, to burn for fuel. And 
when they moved house, they did so. The only transport available then were horses and carts, and that's how they moved. Uh, and there are photos there of that family. They are interesting, their story is interesting, four of them. Uh, in 19, the husband was born in Dundee, uh, not Jersey. The wife was a Jersey woman. Uh, they had, in 1942, when the order came for families where the head of the household was a British origin, but not uh, born in the Channel Islands, to be moved to a camp in Germany with the family. 24 hours and they'd gone. And I helped them pack things. They could only take what they could carry. And uh, they all survived. Although the youngest child, who was three, uh, did become so ill that she died when she was still a schoolgirl. But the others all survived. One is still alive now in her late 80s. Uh, and they were in uh, an internment camp in Germany. I see another photo with friends. I see her when I was briefly uh, in a play at the Opera House. The arts, a rather pompous word may be for what was largely amateur, but during the German occupation, the arts amateur theatre, music, concerts, variety, dance, flourished. We had to make our own entertainment. Some of it was mediocre. Some of it, frankly, should not have been put, made public at all. Some of it was excellent particularly some of the theatre. I see a photograph of four pretty girls playing leapfrog on the beach. There's a kind of miss that during the occupation we were never allowed on the beaches, that we were never allowed swimming. That is rubbish. Uh, I think for a period of about two weeks after the D-Day landings in Normandy in June 44, the beaches were closed, which I would have thought was understandable. Although even then, I could remember still bathing daily in the Havde swimming pool. That remained open. Now, outdoor photographs. You know, you people will say, of course you couldn't take a camera out of doors. That was rubbish. You dare not photograph anything military. You would then have been arrested, obviously. But if you were not too blatant with the camera, you photograph girls having played leapfrog or photographed a group sitting at a cafe. A cafe? Open for business? Oh, yes. What did they serve? They served ersatz, the German word for substitute, and a, a German word that everybody learned. Uh, everybody learned some German words, even someone as sedate as my mother, and they learned the wrong words. Uh, and But uh, ersatz was substitute, and all a, a cafe could serve would be 
coffee made from parsnip peelings or uh, uh, acorns. I didn't drink it. I drank normally water. But there we are sitting with Gory Castle in the background. Gory Castle was not open to the public. The Germans were installed there. There's a photograph of me, age 21. Oh, and outside the office with the staff, including an old man. Yes, the office boy had an extraordinary, you might say very dull war. Uh, <clears throat> I went to the office on the evacuation day with the aim my parents were going to stay in Jersey. My father was 58. He had many virtues. Uh, a love of work was not one of them. Uh, he owned the house we lived in. He owned another property which was let. Uh, he had a few shares in very uninteresting things in Jersey, like the Gaslight Company and the Waterworks Company. And he said, I am not going to be a penniless refugee at my age. And so he would stay. I don't know that my mother's was opinion was particularly requested or required, but um, they were staying, but I would be going. But I thought I must first ask the boss permission. We were, in general, very, very uh, obedient and docile and correct, in inverted commas, in those days. And I must go to the office and ask permission. But when I got there, the office was open. There was only one member of staff there, the girl of 19, same age I had. And uh, she had been standing there outside. She'd arrived on her bicycle. The chief clerk came, gave her the keys, disappeared, obviously left to join a queue which was nearly a mile long outside the town hall to get a paper to try and get on one of the evacuation boats. Uh, but she was waiting for the boss. She'd opened the office. It was full of people. The boss didn't arrive. Neither did, did the number two. Neither did the more senior, uh, older, uh, shorthand typist. Uh, and the office was full of people, some hysterical. One man slamming his fist on the counter, demanding insurance for very valuable jewellery, of which he had a, uh, a valuation. And I was trying to tell him that uh, uh, I could issue him with uh, an insurance certificate, but it would only be valid on a licensed passenger cargo boat, not one of these cargo boats that would, it would have to be a, a proper mail boat. Uh, uh, and, in any case, war risk was excluded, uh, and he thumped his fist on the table, and I had to let him get on with it and deal with the next person, and the phone was ringing and we couldn't answer it. Three days of trial, and at last I got through to the head office, and I spoke to the manager there who couldn't believe what I was saying. It ha we had not been told on the national news that the Channel Islands were being demilitarized. That was too sensitive, quite obviously, shortly after Dunkirk and the withdrawal of all the troops from Tr Dunkirk was a miracle of planning and luck, but was a defeat. 
it was the withdrawal of the British Expeditionary Force and most of it. And then there was British Expeditionary Force still in Normandy and British Jersey yachtsmen had been asked to help evacuate them from St. Marlow, transporting them out to the bigger uh, transports that were anchored out in the roads that weekend before. But none of this had been announced on the national news. And the manager in Southampton, I'd insisted with the girl on the switchboard that I be put through to him. <clears throat> and he was not going back to Dad's army. He was not Captain Mannering. He was Colonel Square plus, a very pompous man. Well, he rated a chauffeur-driven Humber, which was always parked outside the Southampton office. I mean, he controlled uh, he, the offices in Portsmouth, Bournemouth, Andover, Basingstoke, Winchester, uh, Salisbury. They were all sub-offices under his control. Oh, he was a big shot. And here was I, the office boy in Jersey, having the cheek to insist on being put through to him, whatever next. And uh, when I told him why, of course he didn't believe me. And he even asked me if I'd been drinking. And then insisted in fury that I fetch the manager, the Jersey one, immediately. But I'm trying to tell you, sir, we haven't seen him since Tuesday. I cannot listen to this treasonable nonsense any longer. Uh, if what you're saying is true, an unlikely story, I must say, uh, that manager will be reporting here and he'll be coming back. I suppose you and that girl had better stay there until he does. And that's how I was trapped, and I was very cross. And then on day two of the occupation, I heard that there was to be a meeting of those managers or their deputies who were still in the island. And I, Private Pike, age 19, uh, with a burton suit like Private Pike, with blue-creamed hair, and having bought a hat like Private Pike, a trilby with brim, uh, I went to that meeting. And when there was a paper passed around, which someone had t uh, ruled lines down, name, company, position, I wrote, acting manager. I was 19. What a cheek. Now, this is interesting historically. Uh, I put, I couldn't have been entirely witless because I didn't, uh, I advertised in the paper for a shorthand typist. I didn't say the name of the firm. It was a box number at the newspaper. And I had, I remember this clearly, I had 192 replies because the economy had collapsed. And uh, there were a lot of girls out of work. And some of them were from women with incredible shorthand typing speeds who had been personal assistants to people with really quite important situations who had got on the evacuation boats, and these women were marooned. I was 19. I didn't interview one of those women. They would have terrified me. Can you understand this? They would have walked rings around me. I took a girl of my age, a few months older, most unimpressive shorthand typing speeds, I took her on personality. 
I figured that she would be docile and uh, would never question anything I did. And I was going to have to learn the job rapidly. And I wouldn't have her say, Miss Lesoir, don't you think that we ought to do it this way? Uh, no, she would do whatever I... And it worked splendidly. And there was also an, an old man there. Well, I took him on. Poor old Mr. Rod. He was a self-employed commercial traveller who got trapped here. He had come on the last mailboat to arrive in Jersey. The staff of the company owning the boats had clearly been instructed not to tell people buying tickets of the situation in the island which had not been announced nationally. And so that boat was quite full of other business people, of uh, soldiers coming on leave, travelling on travel warrants issued by their commanding officers, of uh, people coming for a funeral, others coming for a wedding, and there were even holiday makers, because the Underground, London Underground was full of posters. Spend a bottom free wartime holiday in Jersey with posters of pretty girls on a beach. I see a photograph of the Metropole Hotel, which no longer exists, which was in Rosewell Street, is now blocks of flats about to be sold off just recently built, but the German flag flying over it. I took that photograph on the morning of Liberation Day, before the first Brits arrived, and so the swastika is still flying over the Metropole Hotel. The Germans were still... Uh, Oh yes, the peace, the armistice had been signed in Germany between uh, Montgomery signing on behalf of the Allies, I think, and was it F Field Marshal Keitel on behalf of the Germans? Uh, and there was a new Führer. Uh, this was signed, I can't remember dates, but the new Führer was Admiral Dönitz, who was based in Kiel. And this armistice was signed, and the German commandant of the Channel Islands had been instructed by him to lay down arms one minute after midnight on May the 8th, and one minute after midnight, really, of course, it was May the 9th, and that's why we celebrate liberation a day after the end of the war in Europe. And that, I think, was on the morning of the 9th. And then I see a photograph. No, this would have been on the 8th, on the photograph on the 8th. I think by then the German flags were not being flown anywhere. And I see a photograph taken by me from the top of, of a building in the Royal Square looking down on the crowd. Um, a girl in the office knew a girl who had a boyfriend whose sisters, whose father was the caretaker of a bank. And that was how I got up on the parapet and had a pigeon's eye view of the crowd in the Royal Square waiting to hear Churchill's speech at three o'clock. The Germans had given permission for loudspeakers to be fitted to the trees. I saw this in the morning when I was going to the bank. This was still, that kind of life still went on. And uh, I was a bit alarmed. 
Obviously, these loudspeakers could not have been fitted without the permission of the German commandant. And whatever for? And there was a rumour that the commandant in Guernsey, the overall commandant, uh, had re would refuse to surrender. He had told the Jersey bailiff, before I think of surrender, both you and I will be reduced to eating grass. Uh, his name was Hufmeyer. He was a fanatic, and he was capable, as an individual, of doing that. And uh, fortunately, he received these instructions from his superior, Dernitz, but I think he might even have defied those but he realised that he couldn't rely on his subordinates, neither in Guernsey nor in Jersey. Uh, and in the end, he gave way. But he didn't go himself to sign the surrender on the deck of the British destroyer of St. Peterport. He sent an army man and... Uh, at least, and it was by the Jersey commandant's permission that the uh, uh, loudspeakers were being fitted to the trees in the Royal Square so that the Jersey population could listen when Churchill spoke to the nation at three o'clock that afternoon. I see another photograph of the bailiff at a window addressing the population through a microphone, and uh, he has alongside him a, a, an American who was the head, uh, the elected head of the camp of American prisoners of war at Mount Mingum. Uh, most of whom had been captured in a German raid on Groville uh, in March of 1945. And I see a photograph of a whole group of people who were very close during that closing period of the occupation, which was a very grim one. And this photograph was taken uh, about two months later when it looks as if cheeks are already beginning to fill. We had been incredibly, incredibly hungry. I see a photograph here of three young men of whom I was what? Alongside me is a Russian who was hidden for uh, the last 15 months of the occupation by two young men who would have been socially ostracized by a very large number of Jersey people. They were not Jersey youngsters, they were both Londoners or both English. Uh, they had arrived in Jersey in the spring of 1940 to dig potatoes. They were conscientious objectors. They were allowed to have that status, provided they did agricultural work. And they had come here. They didn't know one another until they met on a farm. They didn't know about the evacuation. They were in such a remote place that they didn't know this was going on. It was possible in those days to be in the remoter area of St. Juan, and they didn't know about it. Uh, they would not have lifted a revolver to save your life or mine, still less their own but they were prepared to risk their lives to save the life of this Russian.
They were two, I think, very splendid young men. And another photograph here of that same Russian in the transit camp in Guildford. He had, his English was excellent. He was acting as interpreter to the Russian military attaché, a Major Grozdjov, at the Soviet embassy, who spoke no English. Uh, he was, I don't know what use he could have been, a non-English speaking military attaché. But Bill became his interpreter and had a certain freedom. <clears throat> he was very alarmed at the way all the Russians in the uh, Channel Islands were being put on one list. Now, they were in various categories. There were prisoners of war from the armed services, officers. There were prisoners of war, armed services, other ranks. There was no difference between those. There were civilian Russians, and that was most of them, slave workers. There were uh, a few Russians who had been living in the island as refugees before the war. Somehow they were on the list too, because the Soviet government did not recognize people who had become naturalized British. That was very disloyal. They were not, in the end, deported to Russia, but that was obviously the initial intention. Uh, and, and there were a few civilian Russians, <clears throat> uh, including volunteers, in the German labor corps, and there were a quite large number, uh, several hundred, of Russians in German uniform. Everybody knew the word Scheiser. Never mind what that means. Everybody knew it. You, Mr. Broston, a good, loyal American, however would you know what the word Scheiser means? But obviously you are grinning like a schoolboy. <laughs> <laughs> 